All right, Revelation 10, verse 5. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth. So remember, he's standing on both sea and land. Why? Because he's saying, this is my property. Lifted up his hand to heaven. So he lifts up his hand to heaven. This is why we, there's nothing Pentecostal, charismatic about this. Okay? It's okay. Bible believers can do this too. Amen? I mean, if, if, if God can do it, I'm sure we can do it. Amen? All right. Yeah. <laughs> don't, 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 don't do the rave, okay? Don't do this, okay? Then we know there's something wrong with you. <laughs> Verse 6, And swear by him that liveth forever and ever. So he's swearing by who? By him that liveth forever and ever. For God Almighty, who created heaven and the things that are therein are, so God obviously lives forever and ever, verse 6. He created heaven. He created all the things in heaven and the earth. God created the earth and the things that therein are. God created everything that's in the earth and the sea and the things which are therein. So God created everything that is in the sea too. That there should be time no longer. So Christ is giving a proclamation that time, your time's up. That's the idea. Time's up. Get ready. Why? Because the Antichrist is taking that property for himself. The elites, the wicked ones, they're taking uh, all the Antichrist, the United Nations, they're taking that property for themselves. And God's like, your time's almost up. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, oh, remember the seven trumpets? We got to wait for that seventh angel to sound. See that? So this was like, uh, this is like long before that seventh trumpet. See that? That means this is occurring sometime at the middle of the tribulation. So once we reach the time of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, when he sounds it off, the mystery of God should be finished. So see that whole end times mystery is finally going to be over. 1 Corinthians 13, I understand all mysteries, all knowledge, gift of prophecy. It'll finally be revealed and over at the end of the tribulation. The Bible says it will reveal for the end times. So which means this. Didn't you know that no matter how much you study that book, that a Bible believer in the church age is going to know less than a tribulation saint? Yeah. Oh, what about those poor tribulation saints, Pastor? They don't know the stuff about dispensational salvations and the deep stuff of dispensationalism. So how are they supposed to know that? How do they know about fleeing to the rock, Sila Petra, and then how do they know all this kind of stuff? I mean, poor them, poor them. No, no, they're going to know more than you. Yeah. That's what the Bible says. They're going to know way more than you. Oh, I don't believe in that. You don't believe in that with the advanced technology we got? And when you look at the tribulation timeline, what kind of easy access and growth of knowledge and technology they're going to have? Really, 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 really. You think that you know more than a tribulation saint? Don't be a dopey guy, okay? Don't be a dopey, all right? Don't be a dope-headed person. No matter how much you know, man, a tribulation saint's going to know more than you. So don't worry about them. God will take care of them. All righty then. Let's look at Revelation chapter 10, verse 7. The mystery of God should be finished. So God's going to wrap up uh, the mystery. He's going to reveal it. As he hath declared to his servants the prophets. He did declare that. He declared all the things concerning about, hey, this is the revelation, and I declared it to Daniel, to John. Old Testament prophets gave so many verses on millennium and end times. In your entire Bible, what the topic that will consist more than salvation by grace through faith, the number one topic is not salvation by grace through faith. The number one topic throughout your Bible that is mentioned more than any other thing is the second advent. It's the second advent, the second coming of Jesus Christ. Amen. That is mentioned most in your entire Bible. All righty. Let's look at verse 8. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again. So it's the same voice from heaven John hears, and it's speaking to him again. Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel. Remember, so the book is opened in the hand of the angel. Remember who was worthy to open the little book? 
at Revelation 5, right? It's been open ever since 5. You notice that? So at 10, it's been open. When was it first open? Revelation 5. So it supports, again, about that. It could be referring to that same little black book. Uh, open in the hand of the angel, which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. Obviously, he's standing between land and sea. Again, we know that. And I went unto the angel and said unto him. So John goes to the angel and says, give me the little book. So the, uh, John says, okay, give me that little book. And he said unto me, take it and eat it up. So the angel of the Lord or Jesus tells John, okay, you take this and you eat it. Literally, yeah, literally. And it shall make thy belly bitter. So when he eats it, his stomach's going to ache. It's bitter. But it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. But it's going to be sweet like honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand. So John takes that little black book, probably a Bible, book of Revelation, referring to Revelation 5, and ate it up. So John eats it. And it was in my mouth sweet as honey. So it was obviously sweet as honey when he put it in his mouth. And as soon as I eaten it, when it was digested, my belly was bitter, hurt his stomach. And he said unto me, so the angel of the Lord tells John, thou must prophesy again. So he's telling him, John, you're not done yet. You're going to keep prophesying before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. So look at that. Notice that the book of Revelation, John has to prophesy the end times before what? Peoples, nation, tongues, and kings. That's everybody. So, there's a, remember, watch out for the hyper-dispensationalist. Hyper-dispensationalist, a lot of people confuse these guys with us dispensationalists. Hyper-dispensationalists, what they believe is that practically only the 13 books or the 12 books in your Bible from the Apostle Paul, basically Romans to Philemon, only those apply to you. All the other books are unnecessary and you can throw it out pretty much. What? Why? Because they believe, because hyper dispensationalists, they believe like we do that Christian doctrine is found in the Pauline epistles. And then the, all the other books of the Bible, we know they have a lot of Jewish references or different dispensations. So a lot of their teachings will not apply to us. But hyper-dispensationalists take it to the extreme that basically you can't find anything Christian in the other books of the Bible except the Pauline epistles. No, that's, that's totally wrong, okay? You, prove it. Yeah, I'll prove it to you right now. Yeah. Genesis chapter 1, God created man and woman, and then uh, he told them to be fruitful, multiply, replenish all the earth. You're not included in that? See, this is referring to all of mankind, humanity. You're not a hyper-dispensationalist. Stop lying. Okay, so the point is right here is that the, the book of Revelation, we know that's a tribulation application, and that has a lot of reference to the nation of Israel, but it's not only Jewish. John was prophesying at verse 11 before what? Everybody. Yeah. See? Peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. Why everybody, Pastor? Because it's everybody's... It's not just Jews. There are many different nations out there who will, need the, who will need to know this during the tribulation. So when hyper-dispensationalists say that the church in Revelation 2 and 3 is only referring to the tribulation saints at the Revelation timeline, that the, that the Christian church cannot take any lesson or application from it, they're wrong. They're dead wrong. Remember the problem with anti-dispensationalists? Uh, they're also called covenant theology. Watch out for these guys. They make up a huge number. The difference with uh, anti-dispensationalists and hyper-dispensationalists is that they don't do double application. Yep. That is a problem with all kinds of wrong teachings. They don't do double application. Right. Remember Revelation 2 and 3? We had a lot of fun with double application, right? Yeah. Where we saw Christian church application, tribulation, saint application. If you don't do that, man, you're missing out a lot of light. Yeah. yeah. I, man, you try doing it one application only to the Christian church, that don't work. You try it only one application to the tribulation saint, man, it's not going to answer all your questions. But you combine both together, it just goes, wow, it can go here, it can go here. It's amazing. Yeah.
It's amazing. All right. So um, let's close it here where I'm going to show you about this bitter and sweet. So let's see what the Bible is likened to as Psalms 119. All right, let's wrap this up. I know I'm late, but I have to close it here. So 119, I'm, a, I'm almost done. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your patience. Psalms chapter 119, please. Once you have that one, I want your other hand to go to Hebrews chapter 4, please. I want you to go to Hebrews chapter 4, please. I want you to go to Hebrews 4. And then the other passage to be Psalms chapter 119, Psalms chapter 119. Okay, so first of all, we know that when he ate this little book, that it was bitter. It hurt his insides, right? Why would that be the case? The reason why that's the case is because the Word of God, notice Hebrews chapter 4, and then it is verse 12, I believe. Let me turn over there real quickly. Yep, 4.12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow. And look at this, is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So notice right here, it cuts the Bible, verse 12. But it cuts what? The insides, you see that? So that would explain the bitter part. Man, when the preacher is preaching at you, it's not like, oh, it's so sweet and lovely and delicate. No, it hurts. Amen. Gives you a stomach ache. Amen. Some people, some people who come to a Bible-believing church, their stomach can't handle it anymore, that they have to walk out in the middle of preaching all huffing mad because they're about to blow up diarrhea over there. They had to excuse themselves to the worldly restroom, the restroom of the world. Yeah, that will preach, right? That will preach right over there. Somebody preach a sermon on that, please, right? That's a good sermon there. All right, then. Now let's go to Psalms chapter 119. Now, uh, I lost the verse over here. Maybe some of you might know from memory. But in Psalms chapter 119, it King David rejoices that his words to him were like sweet like honey when he ate it. So that would be found at the book of Psalms chapter 119 as well, which is true. The word of God, and not all the time is just bam, bam, bam. A lot of these idiotic street preachers who believe in sinless perfectionism and deceive and ruin poor families out there and deceive and brainwash them, some of these wicked street preachers think that the Bible's all about judgment, repentance, judgment, repentance. No, there are some things in there that is sweet like honey that comfort you. Look, when you're going through a trial and affliction, that's a moment that when you turn to the Bible not to get spanked or to be cut, you want to see comfort, right? Yeah. You want to see some positive promise from the Lord that can encourage you, right? So that's what a lot of people forget. 